At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Hello and welcome to a rather special Drug Science Podcast. This is the 100th podcast in the series. And uh, yeah, you didn't realize I was going to live that long, did you? But I did. And uh, today, we're going to celebrate another 100th, which is the 100th anniversary of the Maudsley Hospital. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting, therefore, to have someone from that very institution talk about psychedelics to us? And so we are delighted to have Dr. James Rucker, who is a senior lecturer there. He's also one of the pioneers of psychedelic therapy in the UK. And it's an absolute delight to have you on the program, James. Welcome. Pleasure, Dave. So happy you're still alive. (laughs) (laughs) Pioneer in in, in all things and the grandfather of of, of this research, really. So what most of you probably won't know till I tell you that that James was an absolute star in the very first study we ever did, the first clinical depression study. He came to work with us in his spare time for free. It wouldn't have happened without him. And so I want to publicly put on record how grateful I am, James, for, for your efforts. Well, thank you. It's worth saying, though, Dave, isn't it? It wasn't quite for, th- for free, but that actually the NHS paid for that, ah. or at least whatever funding body it is that trains doctors paid for that, because I was in my higher training at that point, and we get a bit of research time in our higher training. So I, I used that and my study leave to come and come and work for you guys. And it was a, pre- it was a pleasure, and it was exciting, and it was new, and it was so different to what I was, what I was doing. <laughs> I vividly remember a Radio 4, Radio 4 getting in touch with me, actually. Actually, this was a little bit before, wasn't it? Because you, I, I published this article in the BMJ, this editorial about psychedelic drugs and the legal status, and it sort of, it sort of caught a bit of a wave and Radio 4 were in touch. And I was a specialist registrar at the time, and I was on nights, and they offered to drive the radio car up to the gates of the hospital at 5 o'clock in the morning so I could, I could pop out and, and, and appear on the Today programme. I had to decline because I didn't think the medical director would be particularly happy about me going on the radio when I was on call. But it was a novel and exciting time back then when we were doing the original psilocybin trial. Yeah, and much things have come from that. So truly groundbreaking. But, but of course, what most people won't know about you is that you, you actually did your PhD in genetics. I did. So tell us a little bit about what made you change your mind and move into psychedelics. Well, what made me change my mind? Um, lots of things. I think that most people who've done a PhD will know this when I say by the time you get to the end of it, you're kind of sick of the sight of it because you've spent three, four years doing nothing but that. My PhD was in sort of molecular and statistical genetics, so it was quite a long way from the sort of clinical work that I was used to. And I think at the end of it, I did have a yearning to get back to the clinical but also I wanted a foot in both camps. You know, I've always been academically minded. So clinical trials really are kind of the perfect marriage for me of, of, of clinical and uh, academic work. And that was about the time that you were starting off your seeing patients in your original Silodet trial. So I dropped you a line and we met up with you and Robin in your office and things started happening. So is it, would it be true to say that you know, you, if we hadn't started, you wouldn't have been in the psychedelic space? Then, or were you thinking about it anyway? I was thinking about it, for sure. 
I mean, I think I'd spent quite a lot of my time working in NHS services and looking at the way we approached illicit drugs and thinking that in many ways we were sort of bashing our heads against a brick wall and really there needed to be another way of thinking about these things, which of course is, you know, work that you've been doing for years and I, I, I largely agree with it. So there was something about me looking for something different for sure just to be absolutely clear, and I'm usually pretty honest about these things, I do have personal experience of these drugs. You know, like many people, I've had a period of experimentation. And I actually personally think that for a psychiatrist, it's really useful. I think psychiatrists should probably experience not only these drugs, but also the drugs that they prescribe, because how else are you meant to know how it feels to take them? But well, of course, there was a great tradition back in the 50s when LSD first came available of, of giving them to trainees to help them understand what it might be like. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was recommended to take LSD so you had empathy with the experiences that people with schizophrenia might have. And I think that's a good thing. I think breaking down barriers between patients and doctors in mental health is really important because I think the therapeutic relationship between patient and clinician or therapist or whatever mediates an awful lot of things, whether it's good or bad. And we put drugs into that as psychiatrists, but really, you know, underpinning it all are all those, are all those non-drug things that result in people either getting better or not getting better. I've been, I've talked to a number of psychiatrists who were in that group in the 50s who were given that experience, encouraged to have that experience. I found it very difficult to get any of them to to write about it. I think their narratives, we should collect them because they're, those people are even older than me and they're not going to be around for very much longer. But it's actually proved quite challenging. I think there's still, there's stigma still about those days and also about the drugs, do you think? Well, I, I, it would surprise me if, if they didn't talk in the sense after they'd retired or you know, surrendered their medical license. But I think it's just, you, know, you get a similar phenomenon in politics, don't you? Whereby as soon as politicians have sort of left the fold, then they start to talk sensibly about drugs. But before that, they can't possibly because of the established sort of stigma and how that's related to power and politics and culture and votes and all the rest of it. If but, area. So you, you cut your teeth on this uh, first uh, depression study and then you went back and persuaded your, your home institution. Uh, did I spell out where you were? Have you told us where you are? Well, I'm sitting in my office, in, in, yes, in, in the mothership, the Institute of Psychiatry, which is a part of um, King's College London. It's right next to the Maudsley Hospital where I did a lot of my training. And when I, when I was first thinking about doing this work, before I, I think even before I emailed you maybe, I actually went to the dean of the IOP at the time and uh, the medical director at the Maudsley and I said, can I use the word psychedelic next to the Maudsley? Because I want to set up a academic special interest group and I want to call it the Maudsley Psychedelic Society. And the dean of the IOP looked at me and he said, yeah, sure, okay. It'll never be mainstream, but go ahead. And the medical director at the Maudsley was actually surprisingly supportive. So that just indicated to me that it was there was a little chink of light, if you like, it starting to appear. And then we did our work, and then I got my NIHR fellowship. Which well, was, yes, you need to tell people what it is, because a lot of our listeners are from overseas, and what, what the plan was, and, and how big an achievement it was to get the NHS to fund a psychedelic study for possibly the first time in 50 years. Yeah. So the NIHR stands for the National Institute of Institute of Health Research, and it's essentially a public funded research body, clinical research body in the UK, so it's taxpayer funded. They release a number of fellowships every year for aspiring academic clinicians. And on the back of the pilot work that we did in Silodep, Dave, I wrote a fellowship application to do a randomized clinical trial of psilocybin therapy and treatment resistant depression. And if I'm brutally honest, didn't think it would go anywhere. And I remember going up for the interview, which was in Leeds, and sitting around this table with about 12 
profs of various disciplines. I, I don't. I think there was only one psychiatrist there. So trying to get them to see what it was I was trying to do seemed incredibly difficult in the time, and they grilled me. And at the end of it, I was pretty despairing and despondent. I thought, there's no way they're going to they're going to give me any money for this and I'm just going to have to let this dream die or at least pursue it by other means. <laughs> I always remember when I got the email telling me I'd got the money, I, I was sitting in some NHS training thing feeling a bit despairing and despondent <laughs> and then got this email and suddenly life got a whole lot better and it, and it, it was amazing. I mean, it, this was 1.3 million pounds and it bought out my salary for five years. It funded a small clinical trial and it brought me back to King's and the Maudsley and the IOP where I am now. It allowed me to set up essentially a clinical trials team. And much has come from that because we developed a relationship with Compass and we did a trial for them that their entire enterprise, their entire effort to develop psilocybin through to licensing is based on. Let's deconstruct some of the things you've said for the audience. So I said at the beginning, we're celebrating 100 years of the Maudsley, but um, most people won't understand what we're talking about. It's, uh, that's a rather English thing to have said. So clarify to us why 100 years of the Maudsley matters to anyone. What is the Maudsley? Well, the Maudsley is a psychiatric hospital. It was founded by a chap called Henry Maudsley on the basis of well, money he bequeathed to set up a hospital for the research and treatment into nervous and mental diseases. And it's a name that's kind of known around the world, I would say. And it's allied to the Institute of Psychiatry, which is now a part of King's College London, but used to be its own entity. And the nice thing about that is there's a sort of interaction between the clinical goings on at the Maudsley and the research goings on at, at the IOP. And it's on the basis of that relationship and interaction that a lot of great research has been done over the last hundred years or so. And of course, it was here in, I think, 1937 or so that Eric Gutman did one of the first well, he published a manuscript detailing his experiments with mescaline, with one of the, which had been synthesized in sort of 1899, I think. But the point is the Maudsley is, is it's the Institute of Psychiatry. It's morphed into that. It's become part of that. And it's the leading psychiatric research institute in the world, arguably. Well, at least that's what some people from there tell me. And I, I don't reason, I have no reason to disbelieve them, frankly. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, so hence I had to ask them about the use of the word psychedelic. And it was nice that they, they said yes. And in many ways, well, they've supported me. This institution has supported me in challenging the status quo, I think, with regards to these drugs. And that's so, so important, James. That, I mean, that there are very few, well, only two universities in the UK that are currently really actively researching psychedelics. A couple of others are, are part of the trials I'm, we'll talk about in a minute. But, but the fact that the, uh, the leading psychiatric research centre in, in the UK and probably the world is su supporting what you're doing is, uh, uh, gives me a great deal of hope for the future. Because not only are you young enough to, take, to see the future, but you, know, you do need an institution behind you. So that's... Uh, it's thrilling. And the NIHR grant allowed you to do what? Well, it allowed me to get paid, Dave. It allowed me to get paid to, 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 to do research, which is actually quite a rare thing uh, for clinicians. But it also funded a clinical trial. So we'd done an open label trial. That's helpful. Why don't you explain to people what we did, what you did rather, at, at Imperial, and then how you want to move on from it? Yeah. So Robin and Mark and, and me and, and various others, we did a trial of psilocybin in treatment-resistant depression, and it was an open-label study, and that meant everyone knew what they were going to get. There was only one group. Um, everyone got psilocybin. They got two doses of psilocybin, and it was a very basic study. It was a sort of basic test of safety. It was a basic test of can we actually do this at all because it hadn't been done. Um, no one had tested these drugs in, in treatment-resistant depression. We didn't know what was going to happen. And it was a success. And the next stage from that is to answer the question, can I put this drug in a more 
complicated clinical trial, which is a randomized clinical trial where you randomize people between two groups and then compare the difference between them, the two groups being one who gets psilocybin and one who doesn't. All sorts of problems with that design when it comes to psychedelics, but we won't get into that now. But that's what the NIHR funded. And we're we're at the end of that trial now. It's taken a few years to recruit, but it's a proper clinical trial. It's called a CTIMP, which means that um, it's externally audited and people come in and check and there's eye-watering amounts of bureaucracy and oversight and all the rest of it. And they take a long, long time to do and they are very expensive. And that's what I spend my time doing now. CTIMPs using psychedelics, MDMA, ketamine, DMT, all of these things. Fantastic. Utterly amazing to me. If, if anyone had told me this is what I'd be doing with my career 15 years ago, I would have laughed in their face. But that's an indication of how the world's changed, I guess. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly. And then you, you touched on, or you mentioned the in fact you'd help Compass Pathways do a very interesting study. So tell people about what Compass Pathways is and what your study was. So Compass Pathways, are, they're essentially... But by the sort of a life sciences company, I think that's how they would describe themselves. But to all intents and purposes, they're a pharma company because they're developing psilocybin through the clinical trials pipeline to licensing. Licensing is just a term used for when a drug gets approved for doctors to use. Can't use psilocybin at the moment because it's a schedule one drug, has no license, no doctor can prescribe it unless they have a special license. So Compass have raised a lot of money to fund these trials. And they cost hundreds of millions of dollars. But before you get onto those inpatient trials, you have to do what's called healthy volunteer trials. And that's what we did with Compass. And part of the reason we had to do those was because the regulatory authority said to Compass, you can't have a therapist sit with anyone under the influence of a psychedelic, a patient under the influence of psychedelic, unless they've had experience with healthy volunteers. And the only way you could do that is to do a phase one trial, a healthy volunteers trial, which is what we did because psilocybin is in the legal drugs. You can only do it through a clinical trial. So within this clinical trial, we flew all these therapists in from all around the world. It was a logistical nightmare. And they sat with participants under the influence of psilocybin. And we had a senior psychotherapy supervisor called Fred Reinholdt from who'd been previously worked at Johns Hopkins. And we were connected with Bill Richards and Peter Gasser and various other people, you know, pioneers in the field. And we did that trial in record time. It took us about a year to do that trial, which was amazing in retrospect. And that was the basis on which those therapists that subsequently went on to deliver the phase 2B trial. Yes, this comes out in a minute. Just tell us a bit more about this. how did it run? How did you run this uh this therapist trial then? It was in a group? It was a group, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Did you, that, was, that was also quite novel, wasn't it? Yeah, so it was, well, it was, the term was simultaneous administration rather than group because whilst people were all in the same area, we gave psilocybin to up to six people at the time. They all had their eye shades and headphones and they were separated by curtains and that sort of thing. But to all intents and purposes, yes, they, they were essentially a group. And, you know, the idea was partly with that trial, can you do that? Can you give it to groups? Because if you can, then it makes the economic argument for delivering as a treatment a lot stronger because you need less people to do it. It costs less, et cetera, et cetera. So that was another thing that we showed in that trial. It's, it's okay to give it to more than one person at the same time. Although we kind of knew that from uh, shamanistic ayahuasca ceremonies for a, a few thousand years, but I guess it's good to, it's good to do it in the, with the modern regulators uh, looking at you under the microscope. You did it, and it worked, and it was safe. Yeah. Did you have any problems? Did you have any, were there any issues with that? I mean, people were accepting of it? Uh, the regulators were, yeah. Yeah, they, they, were, they were fine as far, as far as I remember. I mean, they were reassured by the fact that people had one-to-one -one support. So there Doesn't was a therapist there dedicated to that participant. And we also had medics and nurses on call. And we had a senior therapist overseeing things who, who, who had experience of delivering psilocybin therapy. So the scene was set, I think, for that. So we've really reached a milestone moment 
We're celebrating our 100th episode of the Drug Science Podcast, and we really couldn't have done this without each and every one of you. So to make the celebration even more special, we've got a big announcement for you. Starting from this episode, you now have the chance to directly engage with our guests. We're introducing the Ask the Guest segment. So in the show notes for this episode, you'll find a link to a Google form where you can submit your burning questions for our future guests. And we'll be updating this form every month with the exciting lineup of guests that we're due to interview. So imagine this, you could get your question answered on the podcast by some of the most brilliant minds in the field. Whether it's about groundbreaking research, personal experiences, or just your curiosity that you've always had, this is your chance to be a part of the conversation. So dive into the show notes, find the Google form and submit your questions. And we can't wait to see what you come up with. And we look forward to making this podcast even more interactive and engaging with your contributions. So thank you so much for being a part of the drug science community. Here's to 100 episodes and if all goes well, 100 more. Now back to the show. Well, that gave you the confidence then. Well, that's why we're having these interviews, because they're going to be laid down for posterity. This is a per- a permanent record, James. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, so I, I have to mention someone at this point, because she's been so pivotal. And I, I often, I don't like the fact that, that I get a lot of attention around this, because actually there are so many un, unsung heroes. And I recruited a research assistant called Catherine Bird, so fresh out of M- an, an MSc at UCL. And she has just been fantastic. She's still with us now. She's now a sort of senior trials manager. Research assistants, just to explain, they do far more than the name implies because they basically coordinate uh, clinical trials and research. And Catherine coordinates that clinical trial, getting 90 people in, flying therapists in, you know, all of that, delivering psilocybin, psilocybin to them safely, coordinating the data collection, making sure it was all correct and all the rest of it. And then, you know, through to closing down the study and finally publishing it, she was amazing. Uh, and she is an un- unsung hero. And I wouldn't feel I'd done anyone justice if I hadn't mentioned her. Many others as well. I won't, I won't go through that now. And then springboarding from that, you then worked with Compass to do, which is actually truly, probably to date, the most remarkable psychedelic study ever been done in, in anywhere, and certainly in depression, the landmark study. Tell us about that. Yeah, so this was, it was something called a multi-center trial. So you can do trials in single centers and you can observe certain results but the question is does that generalize beyond the center in order to license a treatment you have to show it generalizes because then you can infer that it's probably going to work through the population so the trial we did with compass and many other sites around the world did with compass was a multi-center randomized control trial of psilocybin therapy and treatment resistant depression And the number of participants there, I think, was 230, 240-odd, which is a big deal um, when you consider the amount of work that goes into one participant for psilocybin therapy and all the people you have to screen to get a participant, et cetera, et cetera. It was a huge deal. And, yeah, I I think there must have been 20, 30 sites around the world recruiting for that study all over Europe. As I say, we sort of trained the therapists for, for, for many of them it was a clever study in the way. It was a clever study. Because if you remember, Dave, we did in our original trial, we had 10 milligram, 25 milligram dose. We'd started off with 10 and then we went to 25. It's a sort of basic safety thing, really. But Compass's idea was, you know, which one of those doses is actually better in terms of effectiveness and safety? Because there's always this balance between effectiveness and safety in drugs. So is it the 10 milligram or is it 25 milligrams? So they designed quite a clever study in which they randomized people into three group groups. And they all got psychological support, but they either got one milligram of psilocybin, 10 milligrams of psilocybin, or 25 milligrams of psilocybin. That was quite a clever design because it kind of confused people about which group they were in. Because psilocybin, you know, you kind of tell when you get it but if you if you know that everyone's going to get psilocybin and you don't know which dose it is it kind of introduces a bit of confusion and what you saw with that trial 
was this nice dose dependent effect. So what do I mean by dose dependent effect? I mean that um, as the dose of the drug goes up, the effectiveness goes up. And that gives you some idea that the drug is doing something rather than the contextual elements around it, like the therapy and all the rest of it. So that was a great result. It was funny though, because Compass's share price fell after that. Uh, whereas for me, that trial was actually great. It was, it was really credible. You weren't seeing absolutely you know, dramatic falls. You got a decent placebo response. So actually from a clinical perspective, this was really believable. Um, I thought it was a really good result. Well, in fact, what was remarkable, I, I, well, I, I thought it was brilliant because it kind of replicated, almost exactly replicated our study in terms of the outcome, the 25 milligram outcome was, you could almost superimpose the graphs, couldn't you? It was really, uh, I thought, you know, very, very exciting. And the fact, as you say, that, that the world didn't share that excitement, is, is got, it tells you something's really weird about you know, the investors in the drug discovery field, because, I mean, that you couldn't have expected, to expect better was utterly daft. And yet, you know, they obviously wanted it better. It says something about, it says something about, you know, human beings and, and, and the way we want sort of simple solutions to complex problems like depression. And I think there was a whole load of people who, in, who just thought, you know, psychedelics were the answer, a bit like a bit like they did in the 60s, maybe. And that trial actually dispelled that myth in a way. But for me, as someone who deals with you know, people with mental illness and, you know, I, myself, I've had mental illness and continue to do so in a way. I know that there is no one one size fits all solution. There is no one solution to something complex like 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 depression. So this was believable. This made people who were otherwise skeptical of psychedelics big time, you know, because of all the stigma. This made them turn their heads towards it, and that was a big thing. That was a big thing. Yeah, no, it's a remarkable study. And uh, just before we go on to the the follow up, which you're obviously leading now. Tell people a little bit about the the nature of the therapy, the, how you organize the, the treatment for a particular patient. What's the process? Yeah, well, so we recruit someone into a study, so they have to fulfill certain criteria, inclusion and exclusion criteria. And the basic idea with that is you can't recruit people who are too ill into a clinical trial of an experimental intervention. It's just not ethical. On the other hand, you want them to be ill enough that if there is a therapeutic effect of the drug that you're going to see something. So you don't want them to just spontaneously get better. For example, a lot of people with depression will spontaneously get better. So there is balance uh, and that, that underpins the inclusion and exclusion criteria that are in clinical trials. And actually, a lot of people, for one reason or another, they don't qualify for clinical trials. And it's not just because of those criteria. It's because engaging with a clinical trial is actually quite a big deal from a practical point of view. And it just doesn't suit everyone. You know, people go on holiday, people have got kids, you know, et cetera, et cetera. People can't travel. So there's this whole process of getting someone in front of an informed consent form, you know. But once, once they're there and they're eligible, then... In these studies, they enter into what I call the sort of screening and preparation phase, and we wean them off their antidepressants and we introduce them to a therapist who stays with them throughout the rest of the trial. And that therapist establishes rapport and educates them, basically, about psilocybin, because many of the people on these trials have never had experience of a psychedelic before. And then we measure their depression. We expose them to the drug over one day. They then have a follow-up period in which the therapist stays with them. So do you keep the same therapist through the, the sitting with them through the, when they take the drug? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think that feeling, underlying feeling of safety that you get within a clinical trial comes in part from therapeutic consistency and familiarity with the people who are around you. So yeah, that I think that's absolutely vital. And then the next day after the trip, they, they begin some kind of psychotherapeutic interactions. Yeah. So, yeah, they, we send them home at the end of the day. Uh, they sleep and they come back and we talk and we measure their depression uh, amongst many other things. And then we follow them up over a series of weeks as long as possible. But 
as you know, Dave, you know, the longer you follow people up, the, the more expensive it gets in the clinical trial, which is why so many clinical trials only run for sort of six weeks, three months follow up. And then we have to say goodbye and hand their care back to the person who referred them, their GP or their psychiatrist or, or whatever. And, and that transition can be hard, actually. And I know that there are cases of people who have found that transition very difficult because trials are, you get a lot of attention in trials. You know, people are ringing you up, you're coming in for visits. It kind of gives you something to do, which has a therapeutic effect on depression in itself. So, well, the share price didn't go up, but it didn't go down and you've managed to raise more money. And so now you're moving into the final phase, which is the phase three. Is that right? Yeah. So just, I mean, just to clarify, I'm not connected with Compass in, in any way. They don't pay me anything. They just pay kings and we do their, their trials for them. Now Compass have moved on to the next stage, phase three, which are the definitive trials. Those are the trials that you can take to regulators and say, is this enough to give me a license for my treatment? And if that happens for psilocybin, a whole new world will open up because it is legally incompatible to have psilocybin in Schedule 1 and for it to have a licensed medical use. It has to be rescheduled at that point. But because it's gone through that process of gathering evidence, of convincing governments and regulators in a way that most people can engage with and understand, that has huge social power. You know, that has the power to change minds uh, of people who would otherwise be exceedingly sceptical so let's see what happens, but I, I really hope, and the evidence so far looks pretty good, that psilocybin will get right. What's, what's the timeline for the phase three? Do you have any idea? Yeah, about two, three years, I think. We're going to be recruiting over a year, 18 months, and then crunching data. The whole process, you know, of making sure the data is absolutely accurate and auditable and all the rest of it then independent, someone independently crunching it, then uh, writing it in a way that FDA and MHRA, the regulators, understand, and then going for the license. And they may say no at that point. They may say, no, you've got to go back and study this or that, or just get more data. So the earliest would be three years, I reckon. But it's not a, it's not a three-way design this time, is it? No, it's a, it's, a, it's a complex design, and actually I'd, I would need to go back and, and look at it. It's, it's a much more complex design in which multiple doses can potentially be tried in people, and the follow-up is, 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 is up to a year. So it's a big, complex study. And, and to my mind, that's very... Because one of the things that, uh, as you know, we found in, in, in the study you, know, you were part of, Psilocybin was quite remarkable in the short term, and, and for some people, it did seem to produce enduring changes. But it was like quite a few of the depression began to creep back. And uh, I remember we wanted to try, thought it would be really helpful, probably in these people in whom the depression is re-emerging, to to give them another dose. But obviously, we couldn't do that because the drugs are legal. It was so sad. Uh, that was so sad. I mean, we saw that a bit in the Magic Medicine documentary, and. Yeah, we did. It was so sad to see someone respond and you know, reconnect with life and then slowly for that disconnection to, to creep back in again. But the way it's all set up at the moment and the legal status of the drug, you cannot give it again. We couldn't. We, we just couldn't. And that was, that was a great sadness. But in the Compass trial, there would be an option for that, which is well, actually, again, that would be another world first. Yeah. Well, I mean... More than one dose has, has been tested in other trials. My, my current NIHR trial has up to two doses. But not for escape. I didn't realise, I thought it, the COMPASS trial was to be the first that allowed people to be redosed when they started to relapse, as opposed, or is that what you do in your trial, sorry? Yeah. No, 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 that's not what I do in my trial. And I, I, I think you're right, that's, that's unique. But also we were celebrating, the reason I discovered that it was the 100th anniversary of the Maudsley was because I... I was there a couple of weeks ago for another momentous event. Oh, yeah. Which was the op opening of the, your new centre for psychedelic research. So tell people about that, James. What's it called? Yeah, the centre. It's called the Centre for Mental Health Research and Innovation. And I delib deliberate, we deliberately decided not to mention psychedelic for various reasons. 
But that's a, that is a three-way collaboration between the NHS industry, in this case Compass, and King's College London University. And it's, we took this essentially derelict building on the Maudsley site and Compass have refurbished it and it looks fab now and it has dedicated dosing rooms where you can control the light, the temperature, the music, you know, everything you like. There are therapy rooms, there are clinical rooms, there are team meeting rooms and there's a little wet lab as well where we can take blood samples and then spin them down and freeze them and then go off and do weird and wonderful things with them. It's so much better than what we have now because it has been designed from the bottom up to optimize context, you know, to, to inculcate this feeling of safety, comfort, trust that we think is probably so important in mediating positive out- outcomes, but also mitigating against negative outcomes, which I think is in many ways even more important. So this centre was opened a couple of weeks ago and we start seeing patients there in January. And you're the director, so congratulations. Thank you, thank you, Ruth Allen. And you also, um, you, but you, at the beginning of our conversation, you, you said you were doing things with MDMA and DMT, did I hear you, and ketamine. So tell us uh, the last few minutes a bit more about those, please. Yeah, so this is, I mean, MDMA, as people might know, is actually further along the regulatory line than, than psilocybin. And we completed recently a European arm of the MDMA for PTSD trials that were sponsored and funded by MAPS, Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. And um, that's been a privilege to do. It's quite different in nature to psilocybin therapy. Same, same, but different, but actually, actually quite different. It's, it's therapy plus drug, but it's a lot of therapy plus three doses of a drug. That's what, that's what MAPS tested. And we've seen some remarkable changes in that study. Again, I'm sort of firmly of the opinion that there is something very real going on there. So MAPS have done phase two, phase three trials, which is generally what you need to approach regulators. I think what's, um, what's different about this, I don't know what you think about this, Dave, is it's so labor intensive to get someone through these, uh, the MDMA protocol that their phase three trials have collected in total, I think 190 ish patients. I mean, normally phase three trials have hundreds or thousands of people in them. So I don't know what regulators will say about that. We will see. It'd be really interesting. I mean, it does, it raises an important question. I mean, do you, I mean, like, obviously it's, as you look at the data, uh, that you can clearly see there's a sort of each dose does seem to produce an added benefit, but we can't be, I'm not sure we can categorically say you need three. It would be interesting to know whether, you know, you could get by with them with maybe two. Our, the BEMA trial we did with using MDMA to treat alcoholism, we only used two, um, two doses and that, that did seem to produce, you know, again, you know, a pretty good outcome. But you're quite right to say that the, the MDMA maps trials and PTSD, I mean, they are, they're prodigiously effective, aren't they? So, yeah, really quite remarkable in, in many ways, particularly in comparison to sertraline and proxetine, which are the two things that have a license. So, yeah, the future's bright there. Uh, but there is, you know, once a drug gets over the line, once a treatment gets over the line, that's kind of just the first hurdle. There's a whole, you know, there's a whole process then to then getting it working within a healthcare system. It's got to be economic. Someone's got to pay for it. You know, someone, there's got to be somewhere where you do it. There's got to be therapists available to do it. And for drug assisted therapy like MDMA, it's going to need to be regulated because you're going to need to assure quality. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is having independent people coming in and checking in, in, in my book. All of that costs money, but I think it's probably essential uh, with these drugs where you can put people in psychologically vulnerable states. Yes, and the last thing we want is a, a backlash. Perhaps part of what got them banned in the first place. And exactly, exactly. There are some people who think psychedelics are going to, you know, change the world and sort of should be put in the water and all the rest of it. I, I, I just think that will that risks a backlash like happened in the sixties. In the sixties, it all happened too quickly for society to cope. Plus, it was all caught up in the Vietnam War, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, people take a long time to adjust to change. 
and societies take take even longer. And I think we have to respect that. You know, if you're in your bubble of psychedelic acolytes, then it's easy to to persuade yourself massive change. You know, is it, it, it is the way to go? But but actually, I think we need a much slower and more considered approach to psychedelics if they're going to be brought into mainstream society. And we've got to educate our colleagues, haven't we? I mean, how are you finding? How are you finding your juniors? I guess they're probably quite enthusiastic now. It's a centre. Yeah, they are. Yeah, which is great. It's, it's great, Dave, because I get all this free help. <laughs> just yes. like just like you and me. Um, <laughs> which, um, <laughs> yeah, it makes the trials a lot easier to do. But yeah, I, you know, I think it's the same as it was for me. You know, people are looking for something different and. It's worth remembering that sort of drug development in psychiatry had kind of ground to a halt, hadn't it, post, post-Prozac. There was lots of Me Too drugs, but nothing really particularly exciting. Then ketamine comes along. Then cannabis is rescheduled. Now MDMA and psilocybin are sort of tinkering along as well. Suddenly it's all looking a bit more interesting. Yes, I'm very envious of you, James. Because you've got another 30 odd years of interest. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, then you'll need a treatment for aging, which, which you're not working on. <laughs> Look, it's. Some people approach me about that, but yeah. <laughs> well, can I just say it's been great talking to you, and uh, it's fantastic to see how, in a decade, things have progressed and you've progressed. So, congratulations and, uh, and keep up the good work. Yeah, let's check back in 10 years, huh? All right. Well, if I'm alive, I'll do another one. All right. (laughs) Thanks so much. Thanks so much, James. Take care. Cheers.